Hello, welcome back to class to a Star Books with Jamie, Pandora, and Bella. As always, I'm reminding you to please stay safe, healthy, hit that like button, subscribe, comment below, and hit that notification bell. So today we're getting back into we'll be getting back into Stephen King's It's We Are On Part 4, July of 1958, Part 2 of Chapter 13, Category 5. And without further ado, let's get there. Okay, welcome back. Category 5 of Chapter 13 and Part 4. The reason Mike ran afoul of Henry Bowers and his not-so-merry band on that same day was because the next day was the <coughs> glorious 4th... <fourth, coughs> sorry. 4th. <clears throat> the church school had a band <coughs> in which Mike played the trombone. On the 4th, the band would play would march in the annual holiday parade playing the Battle Hymn of the Republic, Onward Christian Soldiers, and America the Beautiful. This was an occasion that Mike had been looking forward to for over a month. He walked to the final rehearsal because his bike got a busted chain. The rehearsal was not scheduled until 2.30, but he left at 1 because he wanted to polish his trombone, which was stored in the school's music room, until it glowed. Although his trombone playing was really not much better than Richie's voices, he was fond of the instrument, and whenever he felt the half, when he felt blue a half an hour foghorning, foghorning Sousa marches, hymns, or patriotic airs, cheered him right up again. There was a can of Saddler's brass polish in one of the flat pockets of his khaki shirt, and two or three clean rags were dangling from the hip pocket of his jeans. <clears throat> the thought of Henry Bowers was the furthest thing from his mind. He glanced behind as he approached Nybolt Street and the church school would have changed his mind in a hurry because Henry Victor Belch, Peter Gordon, and Moose Sadler were spread across the road behind him. If they had left the Bowers house five minutes later, Mike would have been out of sight over the crest of the next hill. The apocalyptic rock fight and everything that followed it might have happened differently or not at all. But it was, not, it was Mike himself, years later, who advanced the idea that perhaps none of them were entirely their own masters in the events of that summer. That if luck and free will had played parts, then their roles had been narrow ones. He would point out a number of these suspicious coincidences to the others at their reunion lunch. But there was at least one of which he was unaware. The meeting in the Barrens that day broke up when Stan Yours produced the Black Cats and the Losers Club, headed towards toward the dump to shoot them off. And Victor Belch and the others had come out to the Bowers farm because Henry had firecrackers, cherry bombs, and M-80s. The possession of these last would, a few years hence, become a felony. The big boys were planning to go be down beyond the train yard coal pit and explode Henry's treasure. None of them, not even Belch, went out to the Bowers farm under ordinary circumstances, primarily because of Henry's crazy father, but also because they always ended up helping Henry do his chores, the weeding, the endless rock picking, the lugging of wood, the toting of water, the pitching of hay, the picking of whatever happened to be ripe at the time of the season, peas, cukes, tomatoes, potatoes. These boys were not exactly allergic to work, but they had plenty to do at their own places, though sweating for Henry's kooky father, who didn't much care who he hit. He had once taken a length of stove wood to Victor Chris when the boy dropped the basket of tomatoes he was lugging out to the roadside out to the roadside stand. Getting walked with a chunk of birch was bad enough. What made it worse was that Butch Bowers had chanted, I'm gonna kill all the nips, I'm gonna kill all the effing nips when he did it. Dumb as he was, Belch Huggins had expressed it best. I don't F with crazy people, he told Victor one day, two years before Victor had laughed and agreed. Victor had laughed and agreed. But the siren song of all those firecrackers had been too great to be withstood. Tell you what, Henry, Victor said, when Henry called him up that morning at nine and invited him out. I'll meet you at the coal pit around one o'clock. What, what do you say? You show up at the coal pit around one and I'm not going to be there, Henry replied. I got too many chores. If you show up at the coal pit around three, I will be there. 
And the first M80 is going to go right up your old tan track, Vic. Vic hesitated, then agreed to come over and help with the chores. The others came as well, and with the five of them, all big boys, working like fiends around the Bowers place, they got all the chores finished by early afternoon. When Henry asked his father if he could go, <clears throat> Bowers, the elder, simply waved a languid hand at his son. Butcher settled in for the afternoon on the back porch. A quart milk bottle filled with exquisitely hard cider by his rocker. <coughs> his Philco portable radio on the porch rail later that afternoon. The Red Sox would be playing the Washington Senators, a prospect that would have given a man who was not crazy a bad case of cold chills. An unsheathed Japanese sword lay across Butch's lap, the war souvenir which Butch said, <coughs> sorry, he had taken off the bot body of a dying nip on the island of Tara Tarawa. <coughs> he had actually traded six bottles of Budweiser <coughs> and three sword joysticks with the sword in Honolulu. Later, lately, Butch almost always got his, got his sword when he drank. And so all, since all the boys, including Henry himself, were secretly convinced that sooner or later he would use it on someone, it was best to be far away when it made its appearance on Butch's lap. The boys had no more than stepped out into the <coughs> road when Henry spied Mike Hanlon up ahead. It's the inner, he said, his eyes lighting up like the eyes of a small child contemplating Santa Claus's imminent arrival on <coughs> Christmas Eve. Or Bell Chuggins looked puzzled. He had seen the Hanlons only rarely, and then his eye, dim eyes lit up. Oh, yeah, nigger. Let's get him, Henry. Belch drove into a thunderous trot. The others were following suit when Henry grabbed Belch and hauled him back. Henry had more experience than the others chasing Mike Hanlon, and he knew that catching him was easier said than done. That black boy could mo move. He don't see us. Let's just walk fast till he does. <coughs> <coughs> Cut the distance. They did so. An observer might have been amused. The five of them looked as if they were trying out for the, that peculiar Olympic walking competition. Moose Sadler's considerable belly jogged up and down inside his Derry High School t-shirt. Sweat rolled down Belcher's face, which soon grew red. But the distance between them and Mike closed. 200 yards, 150 yards, 100 and so far, little black Sambo hadn't looked back. They could hear him whistling. What you gonna do to him, Henry? <clears throat> Victor, Chris asked. In a low voice, he sounded merely interested, but in truth he was wor worried. Just lately, Henry had begun to worry him more and more. He wouldn't care if Henry wanted them to beat the handling kid up. Maybe even rip his shirt off or throw his pants and underwear up in a tree, but he was not sure that it was all Henry had in mind. This year, there had been several unpleasant encounters with the children whom Derry Elementary School referred to as the little shits. They call myself. Henry was used to dominating and terrorizing the little shits, but since March he had been balked by them time and time again. Henry and his friends had chased one of them, the four-eyed Tozier, kid into freezes, and had lost them somehow just when it seemed his ass was surely theirs. Then on the last day of school, the handsome kid, but Victor didn't like to think of that. What worried him simply was this. Henry might go too far. Just what too far might be was something Victor didn't like to think of, but his uneasy heart had prompted the question just the same. We're going to catch him and take him down to that coal pit, Henry said. Thought we'd put a couple of firecrackers in his shoes and see if he dances. But not the M-80s, Henry, right? If Henry intended something like that, Victor was going to take a powder. An M-80 in each shoe would beat off, and that was much too far. I got only four of those, Henry said, not taking his eyes off Mike Hanlon's back. They closed the distance to 75 yards now, and he also spoke in a low voice. You think I'd waste two of them on an effing night fighter? No, Henry said, of course not. No, Henry, of course not. We'll just put a couple of black cats in his loafers, Henry said, then strip him bare ass and throw his clothes down to the barons. Maybe he'll catch Poison Ivy going after them. We gotta roll him in the cold, too, Belch said, his formerly dim eyes now glowing brightly. Okay, Henry, is that cool? Cool as a moose, as a moose, Henry said in a casual way Victor didn't like. 
We'll roll them in the coal, just like I rolled them in the mud that other time. And Henry grinned, showing teeth that were already beginning to rot at the age of 12. And I got something to tell him. I don't think he heard when I told him before. What's that, Henry? Peter asked. Probably about his dog. Peter Gordon was merely interested and excited. He came from one of Derry's good families. He lived on West Broadway, and in two years he would be sent to prep school in Groton, or so he believed on that July 3rd. He was brighter than Vic Chris, but had not hung around long enough to understand how Henry was eroding. You'll find out, Henry said. Now shut up. We're getting close. They were 25 yards behind Mike, and Henry was just opening his mouth to give the order to charge when... Moose Saddler set out the first firecracker of the day. Moose had taken three plates of baked beans the night before, and the fart was almost as loud as a shotgun blast. Mike looked around. Henry saw his eyes widen. Get him, Henry, howled. Mike froze for a moment, then he took off, running for his life. Part 6 of Chapter 13 The losers wound their way through the bamboo and the barrens in this order. Bill, Richie, Beverly... Behind Richie, walking slim and pretty in blue jeans and a white sleeveless blouse, Zorus on her feet. Then Ben, trying not to puff too loudly, although it was 81 that day, he was wearing one of his baggy sweatshirts. Stan, Eddie, bringing up the rear, the snout of his aspirator poking out his right front pants pocket. Bill had fallen into a jungle safari fantasy, as he often did when walking through this part of the barrens. The bamboo was high and white, limiting visibility to the path they had made through here. The earth was black and squelchy, with sodden patches that had to be avoided or jumped over if you didn't want to get mud in your shoes. The puddles of standing water had oddly flat rainbow colors. The air had a reeky smell that was half the dump and half rotting vegetation. Bill halted one turn away from the conduskeg and turned back to Richie. T -t Tiger up ahead, t -t Tozier. Richie nodded and turned back to Beverly. Tiger, he breathed. Tiger, she told Man Ben. Man eater, Ben asked, holding his breath to keep from panting. There's blood all over him, Beverly said. Man eating tiger, Ben muttered, muttered to Stan, and he passed the news back to Eddie, whose thin face was hectic with excitement. They faded into the bamboo, leaving the path of black earth that looped through it magically bare. The tiger passed in front of them, and all of them nearly saw it heavy, perhaps 400 pounds, its muscles moving with grace and powder beneath the silk of its striped pelt. They nearly saw its green eyes and the flecks of blood around its snout from the last patch of pygmy warriors, pygmy warriors it had eaten alive. The bamboo rattled faintly, a noise both musical and eerie, and then was still again. It might have been a breath of summer breeze, or it might have been the passage of an African tiger on its way toward the old cape side of Bar the barrens. Gone, Bill said. He let out a pent-up breath and stepped out onto the path again. The others followed suit. Richie was the only one who had come armed. He produced a car cat pistol with a friction-taped hand grip. I could have had a clear shot of them if you'd moved, Big Bill, he said grimly. He pushed the bridge of his old glasses up on his nose with the muzzle of the gun. There's wa wa watusas around, ha huh, ha, huh, here, Bill said. Ka ka, can't ru risk a shot. Ya yeah, ya, yeah, you wa wa want them down on ta ta top of us? Oh, Richie said, convinced. Bill made a come on gesture with his arm, and they were back on the path again. Which narrowed into a neck at the na into a neck at the end of the bamboo patch. They stepped out onto the bank of the Kanduskeg, where a series of stepping stones led across the river. Ben had showed them how to place them. You got a big rock and plopped it in the water. Then you got a second and plopped it in the water while you were stepping on the first. Then you got a third and plopped it in the water while you were stepping on the second, and so on until you were all the way across the river, which here. And at this time of year, it was less than a foot deep and shaled with tawny sandbars, with your with your feet still dry. The trick was so simple; it was damn near babyish, but none of them had seen it until Ben pointed it out. He was good at stuff like that, but when he showed you, he never f made you feel like a dummy. They went down the bank in single file and started to cross the dry banks of the rocks they had planted. <clears throat> 
Bill Beverly called urgently. He froze at once, not looking back. Arms held out the water, chuckled, and rolled around him. What? There's a piranha fish. There's piranha fish in here. I saw them eat a whole cow two days ago. A minute after it fell in, there was nothing but bones. Don't fall off. Right, Bill said. Be careful, men. They teared their way across the rocks. A freight train, freight train charged by on the railway embankment as Eddie Kasprak neared the halfway point, and the sudden blast of its air horn caused him to jiggle on the edge of balance. He looked into the bright water, and for one moment, between the sun flashes that darted across, air, that darted arrows of light into his eyes, he actually saw the cruising piranhas. They were not part of the make-believe that went with Bill's jungle safari fantasy. He was quite sure of that. The fish he saw looked like oversized goldfish with the great ugly jaws of catfish or groupers. Saw teeth protruded between their thick lips, and, like goldfish, they were orange. As orange as the fluffy pom-poms sometimes saw in the suits the clowns wore at the circus. They circled in the shallow water, gnashing. Eddie pinwheeled his arms. I'm going in, he thought. I'm going in, and they'll eat me alive. Then Stanley Yurz gripped his wrist firmly and brought him back to dead center. Close call, Stan said. If you fell in, your mother would give you heck. Thoughts of his mother were, for once, the furthest things from Eddie's mind. The others had gained the far bank now and were counting cars in the freight. Eddie stared wildly into Stan's eyes and looked into the water again. He saw a potato chip bag go dancing by, that, but that was all. He looked up at Stan again. Stan, I saw. What? Eddie shook his head. Nothing, I guess. He said, I'm just a little... But they were there. Yes, they were. And they would have eaten me alive. Jumpy the tiger, I guess. Keep going. This western bank of the Kanduskeg, the old Cape Bank, was a quagmire of mud during rainy weather and the spring runoff. But there had been no heavy rain in Derry for two weeks or more, and the bank had tried had dried to an alien crack glaze from which several of those cement cylinders poked, casting grim little shadows. About twenty yards farther down, a cement pipe jutted out over the Kanduskeg and spilled a steady, thin stream of foul-looking brown water into the river. Ben said, quietly, it's creepy here. And the others nodded. Bill led them out the dry bank and back into the heavy shrubbery, where bugs whirred and chiggers chigged. Every now and then there would be a heavy ruffle of wings as a bird took off. Once a squirrel ran across their path, and about five minutes later, as they approached the low wrinkle of ridge that guarded the town dumps blindside a large rat with a bit of cellophane caught in its whiskers trundled in front of bill passing along its own secret run through its own microcosmic wilderness the smell of the dump was now clear and pungent a black column of smoke rose in the sky the ground while still heavily overgrown except for their own narrow path began to be strewn with litter bill had dubbed this dump dandruff, his dump dandruff, and Richie had been delighted. He had laughed almost until he cried. You ought to write that down, Big Billy said. That's really good. Papers caught on branches wavered and flapped like cut-rate pen pennants, but here with a, was a silver gleam of summer sun reflected from a clutch of tin cans lying at the bottom of a green and tangled hollow. There the hotter reflection of sun rays bouncing off a broken beer bottle. Beverly spied a baby doll, its plastic skin so brightly pink it, it looked almost boiled. She picked it up, then dropped it with a little cry as she saw the whitish-gray beetles squirming from beneath its moldy skirt and down its rotting legs. She rubbed her fingers on her jeans. They climbed to the top of the ridge and looked down into the dump. Oh, crap, Bill said, and jammed his hands into his pockets as the others get gathered around him. They were burning the northern end today, but here at their end, the dump keeper, he was in fact Armando Fazio, Mandy to his friends, and the bachelor brother of the Derry Elementary School janitor, was tinkering on the World War II D9 dozer he used to push the, used to push the crap into piles for burning. His shirt was off and the big portable radio sitting under the canvas parasol on the dozer's seat putting out the Red Sox Senator's pregame festivities. Can't go down there, Ben agreed. Mon Mandy Fazio was not a bad guy, but when he saw kids in the dump, he ran them off at once because of the rats, because of the poison he regularly sowed to keep the rat population down. 
because of the potential for cuts, falls, and burns, <laughs> but mostly because he believed a dump was no place for children to be. Ain't you nice, he would yell at the kids he spied, who had been drawn to the dump with their 22s to plink away at bottles or rats or seagulls. Or by the exotic fascination of dump picking, you might find a toy that still worked, a chair that could be mended for a clubhouse, a junk TV with a pitcher tube still intact. If you threw a rock through one of these, there was a very satisfying explosion. Ain't you kids nice, Mandy would bellow. He bellowed not because he was angry, but because he was deaf and wore no hearing aid. Didn't your folks teach you to be nice? Nice boys and girls don't play in the dump. Go to the park. Go to the library. Berry. Go down to the community house and play box hockey. I never heard of that. Be nice. Nope, Richie said, guess the dump's out. They all sat down for a few moments to watch Mandy work on his dozer, hoping he would give up and go away, but not really, believing he would. The presence of the radio suggested Mandy intended to stay all afternoon. It was enough to solve the Pope, Bill thought. There's really no better place to come with firecrackers than the dump. You could put them under tin cans and then watch the cans fly into the air when the firecrackers went off. Or you could light the fuses and drop them into bottles and then run like hell. The bottles didn't always break. But usually they did. Wish we had some M80s, Richie sighed, unaware of how soon one would be chucked at his head. My mother says people ought to be happy with what they have, Eddie said. So solemnly that they all laughed. When the laughter died away, they all looked toward Bill again. Bill thought about it and then said, I know, know a p place. There's an old gr gr gravel pit at the end of the b barrens by the tut tut train yards. Yeah, Stan said, getting to his feet. I know that place. You're a genius, Bill. Yeah. They'll really echo there, Beverly agreed. Well, let's go, Richie said. The six of them, one shy of the magic number walked along the brow of the hill, which circled the dump. Mandy Fazio glanced up once, saw them silhouetted against the blue sky like Indians out on a raiding party, thought about hollering at them. The Barrens was no place for kids. And then he turned back to his work and said, at least they weren't in his dump. Part 7 of uh, Chapter 13 Mike Hanlon ran past the church school without pausing and pelted straight up Nybolt Street toward the dairy train yards. There was a janitor at NCS, but Mr. Gendron was very old and even deafer than Mandy Fazio. Also, he liked to spend most of his summer days asleep in the basement by the summer silent boiler stretched out in a battered old reclining chair with the dairy news in his lap. Mike would still be pounding on the door and shouting for the old man to let him in when Henry Bowers came up behind him and tore his freaking head off. So Mike just ran, but no, not blindly. He was trying to pace himself, trying to control his breathing, not yet getting all going all out. Henry Belts and Moose Sadler presented no problems. Even relatively fresh, they ran like wounded buffalo. Victor Chris and Peter Gordon, however, was much faster. As Mike passed the house where Bill and Richie had seen the clown or the werewolf, he snapped a glance back and was alarmed to see that Peter Gordon had almost closed the distance. Peter was grinning cheerfully. A steeplechase grin, a full out polo grin, a pipe, a pip pip jolly good show grin, and Mike thought, I wonder if he'd grin that way if he knew what's going to happen if they catch me. Does he think they're just going to say, tag your it and run away? As a train yard gate with its sign, private property keep out violators when prosecutor, prosecutor loomed up, Mike was forced to let himself out to the limit. There was no pain. His breathing was rapid yet still controlled, but he knew everything was going to start hurting if he had to keep his pace up along. This pace up along. The gate was standing halfway open. He snapped a second look back and saw that he'd pulled away from Peter again. Victor was perhaps ten paces behind Peter. The others were now forty or fifty yards back. Even in that quick glance, Mike could see the black anger on his face. He skittered through the opening world opening whirled and slammed the gate closed. He heard the click as it latched. A moment later, Peter Gordon slammed into the chain link, and a moment after that, Victor Chris ran up beside him. Peter's smirk was gone. A sulky, balked look had replaced it. He grabbed the latch, but of course there was none. The latch was on the inside. Credibly, he said, come on, kid, open the gate. That's not fair. 
What's your idea of fair? Mike asked, panting. Five against one? Fair up. Oh, he's a nitwit. Peter repeated, as if he had not heard Mike at all. Mike looked at F Victor, saw the troubled look in Victor's eyes. He started to speak, but that was when the others pulled up to the gate. Open up, Nick. Henry bawled. He began to shake the chain link with such ferocity that Peter looked at him, startled. Open up. Open up right now. I won't, Mike said quietly. Open up, Belt shouted. Open up, you effing jigaboo. Mike pat backed away from the gate, his heart beating heavily in his chest. He couldn't remember ever being quite this scared, quite this upset. They lined the side of the gate, shouting at him, calling him names. And he had never dreamed existed. Night fighter, Ubangi, Spade, Blackberry, Jungle Bother, Bunny, others. He was barely aware that Henry was taking something from his pocket, that he had popped a wooden match alight with his thumbnail, and then a round red something came over the fence, and he flinched instinctively away as a cherry bomb exploded to his left, kicking up dust. The bang silenced them all for a moment. Mike started them believing, stared unbelievingly at them through the fence. They stared back. Peter Gordon looked utterly shocked, and even Belts looked stunned. They are scared of him now, Mike thought suddenly, and a new voice in spoke inside of him, perhaps for the first time, a voice that was disturbingly adult. They are scared, but that won't stop them. You've got to get away, Mikey, or something's going to happen. Not all of them will want it to happen, maybe, not Victor, and maybe not Peter Gordon. But it will happen anyway, because Henry will make it happen. So get away, get away fast. He backed up another two or three steps. Then Henry Bowers said, I was the one who kill one killed your dog. Piece of shit, that's what he is. Mike froze, feeling as if he had been hit in the belly with a bowling ball. He stared in Henry Bowers' eyes and understood that Henry was telling the simple truth. He killed Mr. Chips. The moment of understanding seemed nearly eternal to Mike. Well, he gets his just desserts stuck in the mental institution. Seemed to turn nearly eternal to Mike, looking into Henry's crazed, sweat-ringed eyes and his rage-blackened face. It seemed to him that he understood a great many things for the first time. The fact that Henry was far crazier than Mike had ever dreamed was only the least of them. He realized, above all, that the world was not kind, and it was more than more this than the news itself that forced the cry from him. You honky chicken shit bastard. True. Henry uttered a shriek of rage and attacked the fence, monkeying its way toward the top of the brute strength that was terrifying. Mike paused a moment longer, wanting to see if that adult voice that had spoken inside had been a true voice, and yes, it had been true. After the slightest hesitation, the others spread out and also began to climb. Mike turned and ran again, sprinting across the train yards, a shadow trailing squat at his feet. The freight which the losers had seen crossing the barrens was long gone now, and there was no sound but Mike's own breathing in his ears and the musical jingle of chain link as Henry and the others climbed the fence. Mike ran across one triple set of tracks, his sneakers kicking back, cinders as he ran across the space between. He stumbled crossing the second set of tracks and felt pain flare briefly in his ankle. He got up and ran on again. He heard a thud as Henry jumped down from the top of the fence behind him. Here I come for your ass. Henry bawled. Mike's reasoning self had decided that the barons were his only chance now. If he could get down there, he could hide in the tangles of underbrush and the bamboo where things became really desperate. He could climb into one of the drain pipes and wait it out. He could do those things maybe, but there was a hot spark of fury in his chest that had nothing to do with his reasoning self. He could understand Henry chasing after him when he got the chance, but Mr. Chips, killing Mr. Chips, my dog wasn't a you cheap bastard, Mike thought as he ran, and the bewildered anger grew. Now he heard another voice, this one, his father's, I don't want you to make a career out of running away, and what it all comes down to is that you have to be careful when where you take your stand. You have to ask yourself, Henry Bowers worth all the, is, if Henry Bowers is worth the trouble. Mike had been running a straight line across the train yards towards the storage quant sets. Beyond them, another chain link fence divided the train yards from the barrens. He'd been planning to scale that fence and jump over the to the other side. Instead, he veered hard right toward the gravel pit. 
The gravel pit had been used as a coal pit until 1935 or so. It had been a stoking point for the trains which ran through the dairy yards. Then the diesels came and the electrics for a number of years after the coal was gone. Much of the remainder stolen by people with coal-fired furnaces. A local contractor dug gravel there, but he went bust in 1955. And since then the pit had been deserted. A spur railroad line still ran in a loop up to the pit and then back toward the switching yards. But the tracks were dull with rust and ragweed grew up between the rotting ties. These same weeds grew in the pit itself, vying for this for space with goldenrod and nodding sunflowers. Amid the vegetation there was still plenty of slag coal, the stuff people had once called clinkers. As Mike ran toward this place he took his shirt off. He reached the rim of the pit and looked back. Henry was coming across the tracks. His buddy spread out around him. That was okay maybe. Moving as quickly as he could, using his shirt for a bindle, Mike picked up a half a dozen of hard clinkers. Then he ran back toward the fence, swinging his shirt by the arms instead of climbing the fence. When he reached it, he turned so his back was against, a, against it. He dumped the coal out of his shirt, stooped, and picked up a couple of chunks. Henry didn't see the coal. He only saw that he had the eager trapped against the fence. He sprinted toward him, yelling, This is for my dog, you bastard. Mike cried, unaware that he had begun to cry. He threw one of the chunks of coal overhand. It flew in a hard, direct line. It struck Henry's forehead with a loud bonk and rebounded into the air. Henry stumbled to his knees. His hands went to the, his head. Blood seeped through his fingers at once like a magician's surprise. The others skidded in a stop, their faces stamped with identical expressions of disbelief. Henry uttered a high scream of pain and got to his feet again, still holding his hand, his head. Mike threw another chunk of coal. Henry ducked. He began to walk toward Mike, and when Mike threw a chunk of third chunk of coal, Henry removed one hand from his gashed forehead and battered the chunk of coal almost casually aside. He was grinning. Oh, you're going to get such a surprise, he said. Such a, oh my God. Henry tried to say more, but only in ar inarticulate Gargling noises emerged from his mouth. Mike had pegged another chunk, a chunk of coal, and this one had struck Henry square in his throat. Henry buckled to his knees again. Peter Gordon gaped. Moose Sadler's brow was furrowed, as if he were trying to figure out a difficult math problem. What are you guys waiting for, Henry managed. Blood seeped between his fingers. His voice sounded rusty and foreign. Get him, get the little cocksucker. Mike didn't wait to see if they would bay or not. He dropped his shirt and, le and leapt at the fence. He began to pull himself up toward the top, and then he felt rough hand grab his foot. He looked down and saw Henry Bowers' contorted face. Smeared by blood and coal, Mike yanked his foot up. His sneaker came off in Henry's hand. He pistoned his bare foot down into Henry's face and heard something crunch. Henry screamed again and staggered backward, now holding his Spouting nose, another hand, Belch Huggins snagged briefly in the cuff of Mike's jeans, but he was still he was able to pull free. He threw one leg over the top of the fence, and then something struck him with blinding force on the side of his face. Warmth trickled down his cheek. Something else struck his hip, his forearm, his upper thigh. They were throwing his own ammunition at him. He hung brief by his hand and then dropped, rolling over twice. The scrubby ground sloped downward to here, and perhaps that saved Mike Hanlon's eyesight or even his life. Henry had approached the fence again and now looped one of his four M80s over the top of the fence. It went off with a terrific crack that echoed and blew a wide, bare patch in the grass. Mike, his ears ringing, went head over heels and staggered to his feet. He was now in high grass on the edge of the barrens, he wiped the hand down his right cheek, and it came away bloody. The blood did not particularly worry him. He had not expected to come out of this unscathed. Henry tossed a cherry bomb, but Mike saw this one coming and moved away easily. Let's get him, Henry roared, and began to climb the fence. Geez, Henry, I don't know. This has gone too far for Peter Gordon, who had never encountered the situation that turned so suddenly savage. Things were not supposed to get bloody, at least not for your team. <coughs> when the odds were comfortably slugged in your favor, 
You better know, Henry said, looking back at Peter from halfway up the fence. He hung there like a bloated, poisonous spider in human shape. His baleful eyes stared at Peter, blood-rimmed them on either side. Mike's downward kick had broken his nose, although Henry would not <coughs> be aware of this. Where am I? I'll be aware of the fact uh, for some time yet. You better know or I'll come after you, you effing jerk. The others began to climb the fence, Peter and Victor with some reluctance, Belch and Moose as vacantly eager as before. <sighs> Mike waited to see no more. He turned and ran to the scrub. Henry bellowed after him, I'll find you, Nick. I'll find you. Part 8 of Chapter 13 The losers had reached the far side of the gravel pit, which was little more than a huge, weedy pockmark in the earth now. Three years after the last load of gravel had been taken out of it, they were all gathered around Stan, looking appreciatively at his package of black cats. When the first explosion came, Eddie jumped. He was still goofed up over the piranha fish he thought he had seen. He wasn't sure what real piranha fish looked like, but he was pretty sure they didn't look like oversized goldfish with teeth. Marrow down easy, Eddie, son, Richie said, doing his Chinese coolie voice. It's just another, it's just, it's just other kids shooting off firecrackers. That su su sucks, the r r r r r r Richie Bill remarked. The others laughed. I keep trying, Big Bill. Richie said, I feel like it. feel like if I get good enough, someday I'll earn your love. He made dainty kissing gestures at the air. Bill shot him the finger. Ben and Eddie stood Side by side, grinning. Oh, I'm so young and you're so old. Stand. Yours piped up suddenly, doing an er early accurate Paul Anka imitation. This, my darling, I've been told. Ye can sing, Richie screeched in his pickaninny voice. Locks a mussy. This year, boy can sing. And then in the movie tone announcer's voice. Want you to sign right here, boy, on this dotted line. Richie slung an arm around. Stan's shoulders and favored him with a gigantic, gleaming smile. We're going to grow your hair out, boy. Going to give you a guitar? Going to... Bill stopped, popped Richie's twice on the arm, quickly and lightly. They were all excited at the prospect of shooting off firecrackers. Open up them up, Stan, Beverly said. I've got some matches. They gathered around again as Stan carefully opened the package of firecrackers. There were exotic Chinese letters on the black label and a sober caution in English that got Richie giggling again. Do not hold it in hand after a fuse is lit this morning, Red. Good thing they told me, Richie said. I've all, I always used to hold them after I lit them. I thought that's how you get rid of your frockin' hangnails. Working slowly, almost reverently, Stan removed the red cellophane and laid the block of cardboard tubes, blue and red and green, on the palm of his hand. Their fuses had been braided together in a Chinese pigtail. I'll unwind, the stand began, and then there was a much louder explosion. The echo rolled across the barren, slowly across the barrens. A cloud of gulls rose from the eastern side of the dump, squalling and crying. They all jumped this time. Stan dropped the firecrackers and had to pick them up. Was that dynamite? Beverly asked nervously. She was looking at Bill, whose head was up his, up, his eyes wide. She thought that she thought he had never looked so handsome, but there was something to, to alert, to struggle, too strung up in the attitude of his head. He was like a deer scenting fire in the air. That was an M-80, I think, Ben said quietly. Last 4th of July, I was in the park, and there was these high school kids that had a couple. They put one of them in a steel trash can, made a noise like that. Did it blow a hole in the can, Haystack, which he asked? No, but it bulges out the side. Looked like there was some little guy inside who just stroked at one. They ran away. The big one was closer, Eddie said. He also glanced at Bill. Do you guys want to shoot these off or not? Stan asked. He had braided about a dozen of the firecrackers and had put the rest neatly back in the wax paper for later. Sure, Richie said. Pa -pa. Put them uh, uh, away. They looked at Bill questioningly. A little scared. It was his Abrupt tone more than what he had seen said. Puh, puh, puh. 
put them uh, 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 away, Bill repeated, his face contorting with the effort he was making to get the words out. Spit flew from his lips. Su, su, su. Something's gu gu gonna uh, ha, ha, happen. Eddie licked his lips. Richie shoved his glasses up the sweaty slope of his nose with his thumb. And Bo Ben moved closer to Beverly without even thinking about it. Stan opened his mouth to say something. And then there was another smaller explosion. Another cherry bomb. Ra rocks, Bill said. What, Bill? Stan asked. Ra ra rocks. Uh, uh, ammo, Bill began to up stones. Stones stuffing them into his pockets until they bulged. The other stared at him as though he had gone crazy, and then Eddie felt sweat break on his forehead. All of a sudden, he knew what a malaria attack felt like. Since something like this on the day he and Bill and had met Ben, except Eddie, like the others, was already coming to think of Ben as haystack. The day Henry Bowers had casually bloodied his nose. This felt worse. This felt maybe like maybe it was going to be Hiroshima time in the Barrens. Ben started to get rocks, then Richie moving quickly, not talking now. His glances his glasses slipped all the way off and clicked to the gravelly surface of the ground. He folded them up absently and put them inside his shirt. Why did you do that, Richie? Beverly asked. His, her voice sounded thin, too taut. Don't know, Keed, Richie said. And went on picking up rocks. Beverly, maybe you better uh, go back toward the dump for a while, Ben said. His hands were full of rocks. She, on that, she said. All over that, Ben Hanscom. She bent and began to gather rocks herself. Sam looked at them thoughtfully as they grabbed for rocks like lunatic farmers, and he began to gather themselves. Then himself, his lips pressed into a thin and prissy line. Eddie felt the familiar tightening sensation as his throat began to close up to a pinhole. Not this time, damn it, he thought it suddenly. None of my friends need me. Like Bev said, crap all over that. He also began to gather rocks. Part 9 of Chapter 13 Henry Bowers had gotten too big to, too fast to be either quick or agile under ordinary circumstances. But these circumstances were not ordinary. He was a friend in a frenzy of pain and rage, and these lent him an ephemeral, unthinking physical genius. Conscious thought was gone. His mind felt the way late summer grass fire looks as dusk comes on, all rose red and smoke gray. He took after Mike Hanlon like a bull after a red flag. Mike was following a rudimentary path along the side of the big pit, a path which would eventually lead to the dump, but Henry was too far gone to be bo to bother with such niceties as paths. He slammed through the bushes and the brambles on a straight line, feeling neither the tiniest tiny cuts inflicted by the thorns nor the slaps of limber bushes striking his face, neck, and arms. The only thing that mattered was his hinky head drawing closer. Henry had one of the M80s in his right hand and a wooden match in his left. We caught the he was going to strike the match, light the fuse, sup that ash can right down the front of his pants. Mike knew that Henry was gaining and the others were close on his heels. He tried to push himself faster. He was badly scared now. Keeping panic at bay only by a grim effort of will, he had turned his ankle more seriously, crossing the tracks than he had thought at first, and now he was limp skipping along. The crackle and crash of Henry's go for broke progress behind him called up unpleasant images of being chased by a killer dog or a rogue bear. The path opened out just ahead, and Mike, Mike more fell than ran to the gravel pit. He rolled to the bottom, got to his feet. He was halfway across before he realized that there were kids there, six of them. They were spread out in a straight line, and there was a funny look on their faces. It wasn't until later, when he had a chance to sort out his thoughts, that he realized what was so odd about that look. It was as if they had been expecting him. Help, Mike managed as he limped across toward them. He spoke instinctively to the tall boy with the red hair. Kids, big kids. That was when Henry burst into the gravel pit. He saw the six of them and came to a skidding halt. For a moment, his face was marked with uncertainty. When he looked back over his shoulder, he saw his troops, and when Henry looked back at the losers, Mike was now standing beside and slightly beside Hein Bill Dembro. 
panting rapidly. He was grinning. I know you, kid, he said, speaking to Bill. He glanced at Richie. I know you, too. Where's your glasses, four eyes? And before Richie could reply, Henry saw Ben. Well, son of a bee. The Jew and the fat boy are here, too. That's your girlf girlfriend, fat boy? Ben jumped a little, as if goosed. Just then, Peter Gordon pulled up beside Henry. Victor arrived and stood on Henry's other side. Belch and Moose Saddler arrived last. They flanked Peter and Victor, and now the two opposing groups stood facing each other in, seat, in neat, almost formal lines. Panting heavily as he spoke and still sounding more than a little like a human bull, Henry said, I got bones to pick with a lot of you, but I can let that go for today. I want that. So you little buzz off. Right, Belch, Belch said smartly. He killed my dog, Mike cried out. His voice shrill and breaking. He said so. You c Come on over here right now, Henry said, and maybe I won't kill you. Mike trembled but did not move. Speaking softly and clearly, Bill said, The ba barons are ours. You ca ca kids get out of ha here. Henry's eyes widened. It was as if he'd been slapped unexpectedly. Who's going to make me? He asked. You horse foot? Uh, uh, us, Bill said. We are through t -t taking your crap, but b, b bowers Get uh, uh, out. <coughs> you stuttering freak, Henry said. <coughs> he lowered his head and charged. Bill had a handful of rocks, all of them had a handful except Mike and Beverly, who was only holding one. Bill began to throw at Henry, not hurrying his throws, but chucking hard and with fair accuracy. The first rock missed. The second struck Henry on the shoulder. The third had missed. But Henry might have closed with Bill and wrestled him to the ground, but it didn't miss. It struck Henry's lowered head. Henry cried out in surprised pain, looked up, and was hit four more times. A little belay due from Richie Tozier on the chest. One from Eddie that ricocheted off his shoulder blade. One from Stan Yours that struck his shin. Beverly's one rock which hit him in the belly. He looked at them unbelievingly, and suddenly the air was full of whizzing missiles. Henry fell back, that same bewildered, pained expression on his face. Come on, you guys, he shouted, help me. Ch -ch Charge them, Bill said in a low voice, and not waiting to see if they would not, he ran forward. They came with him, firing rocks not only at Henry now, but at all the others. The big boys were grubbing on the ground for ammunition of their own. Before they could gather much, they had been peppered. Peter Gordon screamed as a rock thrown by Ben glanced off his cheekbone and drew blood. He backed up a few steps, paused, threw a hesitant rock or two back, and then fled. He had had enough. Things were not done this way on West Broadway. Henry grabbed up a handful of rocks in a savage sweeping gesture. Most of them, fortunately for the losers, were pebbles. He threw one of the larger ones at Beverly and it cut her arm. She cried out. Bell bellowing, Ben ran for Henry Bowers, who looked around in time to see him coming out, coming but not in time to sidestep. Henry was off balance. Ben was 150, trying for 160. The result was no contest. Henry did not go sprawling, but flying. He landed on his back and skidded. Ben, ben ran toward him again and was only vaguely aware of a warm, blooming pain in his ear. As Belch Huggins nailed him with a rock roughly the size of a golf ball. Henry was getting groggily to his knees as Ben reached him and kicked him hard, his sneaked foot connecting solid with, with Henry's left hip. Henry rolled over heavily on his back. His eyes blazed up at Glenn. Ben, you ain't supposed to throw rocks at girls, Ben shouted. He could not remember ever in his life feeling so outraged. You ain't. Then he saw a flame in Henry's hand as Henry popped the wooden match alight. He touched it to the thick fuse of the M80, which he then threw at Ben's face. Oof. Acting with no thought at all, Ben struck the ash can with the palm of his hand, swinging it, at, swinging at it as one would swing a racket at a badminton birdie. The M80 went back down. Henry saw it coming. His eyes widened, and then he rolled away, screaming. The ash can exploded a sec split second later, blackening the back of Henry's shirt and tearing some of it away. A moment later, Ben was hit by Moose Saddler and driven to his knees. Seath clicked the, together over his tongue, drawing blood. He blinked around, dazed. Moose was coming toward him, but before he could reach the place where Ben was kneeling, Bill came up behind him and began pelting the big kids with, kid with rocks. Moose 
wheeled around. Bell, and you hit me from behind, yellow belly. <laughs> Mushia screamed, you effing dirty fighter. He gathered himself to charge, but Richie joined Bill and also began to fire rocks at Moose. Richie was un unimpressed with Moose's rhetoric on the subject of what might or might not con constitute yellow belly behavior. He had seen the five of them chasing one scared kid, and he didn't think that exactly put them up there with King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. One of Richie's missiles split the skin above Moose's left eyebrow. Moose howled. Eddie and Stan Yours moved up to join Bill and Richie. Beverly moved in with them, her arm bleeding but her eyes wildly light. Rocks flew. Belch hugged and screamed at, as one of them clipped his crazy bone. He began to dance lumbersomely, rubbing his elbow. Henry got to his feet, the back of his shirt hanging in rags, the skin beneath almost miraculously unmarked. Before he could turn around, Ben Hanscom bounced a rock off the back of his head and drove him to his knees again. It was Victor Chris who did the most damage to the losers that day, partly because he was a pretty fair fastball pitcher, but mostly paradoxically because he was the least emotionally involved. More and more, he didn't want to be here. People could get seriously hurt in rock fights. Kid could get a skull split. Mouthful of broken teeth could even lose an eye. But since he was in it, he was in it. He tended to dish out some trouble. That coolness allowed him to take an extra 30 seconds and pick up a handful of good-sized rocks, throw on Eddie at the losers. So losers reformed their rough skirmish line, and it struck Eddie on the chin. He fell down crying, the blood already starting to flow. Ben turned toward him, but Eddie was already getting up again. The blood gruesomely right against his pallid skin. His eyes slitted. Victor threw at Richie, and the rocks thudded off Richie's chest. Richie threw back, but Vic ducked it easily and threw one sidearm at Bill Dembro. Bill snapped his head back, but not quite quickly enough. The rock cut his cheek, cheek wide open. Bill turned toward Victor. Their eyes locked, and Victor saw something in the stuttering kid's gaze that scared the hell out of him. Absurdly, the words, I take it back, trembled behind his lips. Except there was nothing you said to a little kid. Not if you didn't want your buddies to start ranking you to the dogs and back. Bill started to walk around Victor now, and Victor began to walk toward Bill. At the same time, moment, as if by some telepathic signal, they began to throw rocks at each other, so closing distance. The fighting flagged around them as the others turned to watch. Even Henry turned his head. Victor ducked and bobbed, but Bill made no such effort. Victor's rock slammed him in the chest, the shoulder, the stomach, one clipped by his ear, apparently unshaken by, many, by any of this. Bill threw one rock after another, pegging them with murderous force. The third one struck Victor's knee with brittle, chipping sound, and Victor uttered a stifled groan. He was out of ammunition. Bill had one rock left. It was smooth and white, shot with quartz, roughly the size and shape of a duck's egg. To Victor, it looked, Victor Chris had looked very hard. Bill was less than five feet away from him. Yeah, yeah, you go get uh, out of her uh, uh, ear. Now he said, I'm going to spa, spa let your head, head open. I m m mean it. Looking into his eyes, Victor saw that he really did. Without another word, he turned and headed back the way Peter Gordon had gone. Belch and Moose Sadler were looking around uncertainly. Blood trickled down the corner of the Sadler's boy's mouth, and blood from a scalp wound was sheeting down the side of Belch's face. Henry's mouth worked, but no sound came out. Bill, toward, Bill turned toward Henry. G -g -g Get out, he said. What if I won't? Henry was trying to sound tough, but Bill could now see a different thing in Henry's eyes, he was scared, and he would go. It should have made Bill feel good, triumphant even, but he only felt tired. Uh, if you w won't, Bill said, w we're g g going to mu move uh, in on you, you. I think the s s six of uh, uh, us can p put you in the uh, hospital. Seven, Mike Hanlon said, and joined them. He had a softball-sized rock in his own hand. Just try me, Bowers. I'd love to. You effing nigger. Henry's voice broke and wavered on the edge of tears. That voice took the last of the fight out of Belch and Moose that they backed away their remaining rocks 
dropping from Blackson's hands. Belts looked around as if wondering exactly where it might be. Get out of our place, Beverly said. Shut up, you s cunt. Henry said, you. Four rocks flew at once, hitting Henry in four different places. He screamed and scrambled backward over the weed, rattled ground, the tatters of his shirt flapping around him. He looked from the grim old young faces of the little kids to the frantic ones of Belch and Moose. There was no help there, no help at all. Moose turned away, embarrassed. Henry got to his feet. Sobbing and snuffling through his broken nose. I'll kill you all, he said, and suddenly ran for the path. A moment later, he was gone. Go, 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 go on, Bill said, speaking to Belch. Get uh, out and d d don't come down here anymore. B -b -b Barons are uh, uh, ours. You're going to wish you didn't cross Henry, Kit Belch said. Come on, Moose. They started away, heads down, not looking back. The seven of them stood in a loose semicircle, all of them bleeding somewhere. The apocalyptic fight, rock fight, had lasted less than four minutes. But Bill felt as if he'd fought his way through all of World War II, both theaters, without so much as a single timeout. The silence was broken by Eddie Casprack's whooping, whining struggle for air. Ben went toward him, felt the three Twinkies and four Ding Dongs he'd eaten on his way down to the Barrens, began to struggle and churn in the stomach. Ran past Eddie into the bushes, where he was as sick as, sick as privately and quietly as he could be. It was Richie and Bev who went to Eddie. Beverly put an arm around the thin boy's waist while Richie dug his aspirator out of his pocket. Bite on this, Eddie, he said, and Eddie took a hitching, gasping breath as Richie pulled the trigger. Thanks, Eddie managed at last. Ben came back out of the bushes, blushing, wiping a hand over his mouth. Beverly went over to him and took both of his hands in hers. Thanks for sticking up for me, she said. Ben nodded, looking at his dirty sneakers. Any time, Keed, he said. One by one, they turned to look at Mike. Mike with his dark skin. They looked at him carefully, cautiously, thoughtfully. Mike had felt such curiosity before. There had not been a time in his life when he had not felt it. And he looked back candidly enough. <laughs> Bill looked from Mike to Richie. Richie met his eyes, and Bill seemed almost to hear the click, some final part fitting neatly into a machine out of unknown intent. He felt ice chips scatter up his back. We're all together now, he thought. And the idea was so strong, so right, that for a moment he thought he might have spoken it aloud. But of course, there was no need to speak it aloud. You could see it in Richie's eyes, and Ben's, and Eddie's, and Beverly's, and Stan's. We're all together now, he thought again. Oh, God help us. Now it really starts. Please, God help us. What's your name, kid? Beverly asked. Mike Hanlon. You want to shoot off some firecrackers, Stan asked. And Mike grin was answer enough. And so we're going to stop there. We're on chapter 14. The album of part four, uh, July of 1958. Uh, hope you enjoyed this video. Please be sure to hit that like button, subscribe, comment below, hit the notification bell. You stay cool and you have a great night. Till later.